SD Metals and Markets is sponsored by Docs Deals. Find this week's deals at sdbullion.com slash deals. This week, the Doc is featuring 2016 Gold Buffaloes at only $49.99 over spot, any quantity. 2016 Australian Silver Kangaroos, only $199 over spot, any quantity. And a special free shipping promo. Take advantage of these big deals at sdbullion.com slash deals. This is the Doc and Eric Dubin with the SD Weekly Metals and Markets Wrap. Well, guys, we sure have a lot to talk about this week. Obviously, the big story dominating the financial news space this week, really the second half of the week, is when it burst onto the, the scene in the mainstream is Deutsche Bank. Um, and, and really, it began um, with the Department of Justice in their uh, $12 billion fine. Um, and now, actually, today here, Deutsche Bank is popping a little bit on rumors that um, they're going to settle for about a third of that, but that hasn't been confirmed yet. Um, so let's start start here with Deutsche Bank and uh, what your take is here as, I mean, it it really could be scary here what we're looking at with uh, the collapse of Deutsche Bank. So what's your take here, Craig? Well, you, you nailed it right there. Uh, when this latest crisis was brought on by the announcement of uh, this uh, fine that was going to be coming for Deutsche Bank from the U.S. Department of Justice based upon Deutsche Bank's fraudulent trading in, uh, in fraudulent securities, the mortgage-backed securities back in 2008 and how they were marketed and traded and everything else. Obviously not a coincidence that uh, the Department of Justice wanted $14 billion from them because that's the exact same amount that the EU wanted in back taxes from Apple. <laughs> so that kind of got the ball rolling about a week ago. And we've been speculating all week at my site that, well, all they've got to really do to try to turn this back around is to say, okay, we'll take less than $14 billion, because that was the thing that spooked everybody to begin with. And now those are the rumors today. If anything, it has shined the light on the uh, potentially disastrous consequences of the inaction of all politicians since 2008 to do anything about the situation. In fact, it's only gotten worse. Ever since the repeal of Glass-Steagall in the 90s, banks here in the U.S. and obviously banks outside of the U.S. that weren't subject to it, have levered themselves over and over and over so many times through the use of these over-the-counter derivatives, which are just kind of uh, off books, if you will, agreements from one bank to another as they try to lay off various risks and they find parties and counterparties and the size of those derivatives books is now in the trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars or euros however you want to however whatever currency you want to use and it's worse than it was in 2008 larger than it was in 2008 and uh, that crisis was somehow papered over no pun intended by the central banks but yet any move to rein in these banks any move to prosecute any of the folks that, that brought this upon us has all gone down the drains uh, because all of our politicians are in, the, are in the back pocket of the Wall Street firms and their lobbyists. And, uh, and so anyway, if anything, this Deutsche Bank fiasco of the last week has at least woken up a few people to realize that <laughs> things aren't any better than they were eight years ago. And all it takes is a news event, some fear, to pull a liquidity drain out from one of these organizations and then you know all of a sudden the whole house of cards starts to starts to shake at its foundation so we'll see where it goes from here uh, maybe the rumors will be denied by next week and everything will be going crazy again but for now it seems like they found a way to calm the markets back down this isn't even that much of a reprieve either you know a little bit less than 10 billion dollars reduction in fines to Deutsche Bank and I think this whole negotiation probably went down a bit like a car sales uh, lot where the the initial figure thrown out was high and they were planning on reducing it. But this is a fly spec compared to the problems that Deutsche Bank faces. So the, the happy dance that is being played out in the marketplace right now is um, not really indicative of, of the situation being improved. And we're going to be revisiting this all year. Deutsche Bank is not out of the woods. And I have to ask you guys, I mean, it's very interesting that Germany has a banking holiday on Monday. I mean, what's the potential 
for the situation to substantially deteriorate over the weekend, particularly if these rumors are denied by the Department of Justice later on this afternoon or after the market close? I suppose there's potential there, Doc. But, that's, I mean, it's not something I'm going to uh, spend too much time worrying about. I mean, they seem to continue to uh, paper over these things and hold things together uh, <laughs> every time there's any kind of a hiccup. So I, I would imagine everything will probably just be fine on Monday. But as you said, uh, maybe they won't be. You know, we've also got this, uh, this thing coming this weekend where uh, officially tomorrow the Chinese yuan gets included in the IMF's SDR. A lot of folks wondering if there might be some, some market shakeups and news around that event, which China's out on holiday all next week. Mm-hmm. But again, I, I, I mean, at this point, you know how, you know, we've talked about, you know, you don't go around predicting the end of the world because you're only going to be right once. Um, I'll just kind of take it day by day and see what next week brings. There's plenty of reason to look at the concophony of voices of analysis, and I use those words advisedly, or that word advisedly. When it comes to the alternative assets community bleating about what is going on with respect to the SDR, in fact, everything else. And, you know, I mean, the way Agora Financial is framed, um, Jim Rickards' um, arguments about how, you know, 1st September 30th is, or the October 1st is going to see everything burned down. <laughs> now, Rick hasn't 100% pushed out that message, and, and I must say that to uh, qualify my words. But, you know, the kind of, uh, the kind of you know, the, the analysis that's leading the discussion in our community is a little over the top right now. And we are not going to see the dollar just get flushed down the toilet and see giant changes in the, in the coming 30 days as this transition happens with the SDR. And, and I agree that Monday is going to probably be kind of a sleeper. And there's other reasons why I say that as well, too. Right now, the um, <clears throat> ECB and probably the Fed are doing some pretty interesting things, and we can see footprints uh, of their activity in uh, the seven-day ECB lending facility, and there's a gigantic shortage of U.S. dollars right now being expressed at the end of the quarter because, you know, the central banks in the process of their levitating markets use, amongst other things in their toolkits, repos, and and they move money around, and then they try to rejigger and pull money back in at the end of quarters, and we see all this kind of crazy stuff at the end of quarters very frequently, and I think today we're seeing that. And that that is also part of the backdrop of how this whole Deutsche Bank story fits into this picture. And, and quite frankly, I haven't really, I've only been able to kind of marinate with these ideas for about an hour and not fully put everything together. So I am speaking a little bit off the cuff, and I apologize. But there's smoke here, and it's very clear that uh, the central bankers are very, very busy right now trying to fix um, the crisis that's in the near term with respect to what happened with Deutsche Bank's um, shaking up the markets and psychology. Longer term, I think the Deutsche Bank ultimately will be nationalized in one form or another, maybe only partially. And, uh, you know, Dave Kranzler put out a, a fantastic article yesterday. I, I recommend all of our listeners go and read it. And I also uh, put some comments and analysis on top of that in the News Doctors version. So, except that on the weekend, any of our listeners want to go check it out, just go to the News Doctors, you'll see it. I just would add one thing to what Eric said. The part of what the crisis was this week was kicked off last weekend when uh, Chancellor Merkel said that they, they that the EU yeah. and that the German government wasn't going to stand behind Deutsche Bank and prop them up. Um, and that's all that, denial, you know. Yeah, <laughs> They're going to do it. it. <laughs> They're going to have to because they, they it, can't afford not to. This isn't going to be a Lehman Brothers. I mean, they're right. going to they're going to try to stop this crash, and 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 ultimately, their effort of trying to stop the crash is what later will probably cause the crash. Because the fact that they you know do what they do is going to convince people that the system is truly screwed up. That's the missing ingredient we've had for years that has not had us you know reach that critical point where the psychologist just flushes down the toilet and we have a market crash of of substance that the powers that be can't stop. Well, I think that's the, common. The direction I would add, though, is uh, what becomes likely, I guess, if the Deutsche Bank thing uh, can continues to unravel. Is you know, Deutsche Bank is sitting on something like three or four hundred billion euro of customer deposits. 
Yeah. Uh, we saw, I can't, what was a bail-in percentage in Cyprus? 60% or something like that. Well, what if as we go down this road, eventually there is a 10% customer bail-in uh, yeah. for something like Deutsche Bank? You know, that'd give them 30, 40 billion euro would be enough to keep them afloat. And that would rather that would be a rather positive fundamental uh, for the metals. Short term, only. Uh, in that you know we're already seeing negative interest rates being such a positive fundamental for gold, and part of it, really the major reason why we ran up and but have yet to go back down. It's prompting such physical demand, and you see these stories about safe sales in Germany and secret Alpine vaults in Switzerland, and and all this kind of stuff. Um, if you get a bail in especially at an institution as large and as visible as Deutsche Bank, I'd say that'd be a rather positive fundamental uh, for physical oh, yeah. metal as well. Would, so uh, everybody should keep an eye on this situation just to see if it doesn't eventually trend in that direction. Yeah. I, 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 you know, I've been skeptical about this whole bail-in toolkit edition from day one. I mean, Doc and I were the guys that brought it to the Western market, aside from Wall Street Journal, also making a tiny note about it. I mean, we, we broke the story in the West, and even back then it was very clear that this whole thing was a kind of a joke. I mean, th this toolkit is useless. When you look at the example of Cyprus, when they actually executed a bail-in, excuse me, I said bail-out before I meant bail-in, uh, the, uh, the, the, the figure was, what, $15 billion or something for an entire country? And, and with the entire banking system, it wasn't a singular bank that they were targeting. If they went after uh, the nest egg of German citizens and with even a 30, 40 billion uh, punch in the nose, that, that would cause a crisis all in and of itself. And I think that's part of the reason why the powers that be, the central bankers, all of the policymakers haven't used bail-ins more other than in these weird one-off kind of scenarios like Cyprus. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the problem is, if you do it in Cyprus, whether it's Europe, whether it's the U.S., the average citizen just thinks it's some foreign uh, country, and that could never happen here. If you do that to Deutsche Bank, yeah. I mean, from England to Germany to France to Italy, if you're a depositor there, next as soon as you hear that news, you're running, you're taking money out of the bank. And the reason why Merkel was doing the denial over the weekend is because they, their politicians know that the German public are seriously averse to any kind of bailouts and you know, fiscal improprietary actions by their government. And that whole inflation experience of the Weimar Republic truly shaped the culture of Germany in very different ways than what we experience in the United States. Right. Which kind of leads us to what I personally suspect is perhaps most likely um, and it kind of goes back to something that Jim Sinclair has stated for a long time, that the powers that be, they made a major miscalculation letting Lehman go under in 2008, and it almost cost them the entire yeah. financial system. And he's stated for a long time that they're not going to make that mistake again. So what I think perhaps is most likely, because as you guys alluded to, um, Germany has a history with hyperinflation. Um, their public perception is totally different than it is even the rest of the West, much less here in the U.S., yeah. Ultimately, I would not be surprised at all if it ends up if it does not end up being the Fed that rescues Deutsche Bank. They'll be all of the above. I mean, even the Bank of Japan might get into swap lines for all we know because they're so crazy with swap lines worldwide. But the Fed will definitely be part of that party, no doubt. And the ECB is looking to buy anything they can. You know, <laughs> um, they're they're already driven rates as deeply negative, and they're still finding trouble. You know, they're grasping at anything, junk bonds, anything that they can buy as part of their QE program. You guys still there? Yeah, still here. That was weird. All of a sudden, they had like a commercial about, uh, uh, and now a moment, this moment of meditation, and it <laughs> Chill was out. very strange. Obviously, it's the NSA <laughs> listening in again. Uh, by the way, have you guys covered your camera thing on your computer yet? I just waved, I just waved to him. Yeah, well, I, I finally covered when when Comey said he covered his. I thought, <laughs> okay, it's good enough for me. Um, <laughs> so anyway, no, I just FBI give FBI director I, for those who weren't in on that joke. <laughs> yeah, and he actually said it. He said, "Yeah, you ought to cover that thing." Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, um, I've seen uh, uh, along that. I've seen uh, a picture from uh, Facebook's founder Zuckerberg and. 
in the back it's like at his office at Facebook in the background he's got his own computer has got tape over it <laughs> yeah yeah I just yeah I, so anyway I've got mine covered so anyway you never know who's listening I guess and and at this point I have no freaking idea what I was talking about 60 seconds ago so we might as well just move on to the next question <laughs> Why don't we talk a little bit about gold and silver here, Craig? That's a good idea. I can talk about that. Yeah, we can do that. I know for most of the summer, this is about the time frame that you are looking for the next kind of move up to begin here over the next month. Is that uh, still your take, um, seeing as where we're at here as the month of September draws to a close and fourth quarter here really gets underway here in October? Yeah, it's going to be a, it's going to be interesting to see how things trade even on Monday. Um, a week ago, we started watching on my site the monthly chart because you could draw a trend line all the way back to September of 2011 when price uh, hit that all-time high. And you extend it to October of 2012 and then extend it down. And uh, price has been pressed up against that trend line now for the last three months. And I was, we were slightly above it as we entered this week at about, uh, about 1335 or so. And we thought, wow, if we could somehow close above this on a breakout at the end of the month and the end of the quarter, that's going to look pretty good. And so, lo and behold, uh, in one fell swoop a couple of days ago, as we've seen nearly countless times before, price was sitting right at its 50-day moving average of 1338. And suddenly, a, a massive order appears. We trade about 7,000 contracts over a, a period of about a minute. And price plummeted straight through the 50-day again. Just like, remember, we talked about, I think this might have been the last time we talked. Nanex had caught them the last time they did this yeah. back in August with successive orders one second apart. Well, it happened again two days ago. And uh, now we're back, you know, as soon as we got below the 50-day, then the machines kind of take over. Uh, the spec machine starts selling every rally, and and now that's taking us back down. I've got about thirteen twenty, as we speak. So we're not going to end the month and the quarter above that trend line. Uh, that's again, not by accident. <laughs> and so, uh, it'll be interesting to see now where we go though in the fourth quarter. You know, you mentioned earlier, Eric, the uh, the notion that there's a lot of hyperbole out there in the space, and I think you know besides the fact that people are so frustrated because this has gone on now for three or four years, it is endless uh, down, down, sh downward shove, I guess, let's call it that. We had this awesome start to the year. You know, the first uh, yeah. half of the year, we were up significantly, and gold was up 25% in six months, and silver was up maybe 40%. But this last quarter, we've basically gone sideways. We finished June the 30th at 1327. Like I said, as we speak, we're 13, 19. So we've basically gone just completely sideways for a quarter. And silver's actually up. Silver closed June 30th at 1870. So silver's actually up a couple of percent this quarter. You know, back in 2013, we'd have done cartwheels for a quarter that went sideways. But when we get a quarter like this after all the fireworks the first half of the year, I think a lot of people just get frustrated and, and uh, you, get, you know, you, you just want, you don't want to see things roll back over. So we'll see where we finish the year. I, yes, I still think there's a very high likelihood that we, st we haven't seen our highs for this year. A lot of it's going to depend upon how the, uh, the dollar-yen trades in the next couple of weeks. There is a significant downtrend in the dollar-yen that started back uh, when the Bank of Japan announced negative interest rates back at the end of January. Anybody can pull it up on a daily chart and you can see it. Um, it's now forming a bit of a a triangle versus what has seemingly been staunch central bank support at 100 in the dollar yen. That little triangle is going to resolve itself in the next week or two. It might resolve itself next Friday with the employment report when we get it. Um, if, if, if the dollar yen breaks down through 100, you can look at past correlations and see where if the dollar yen were to go to 95, that would take gold probably to about 1380, 1400. If the dollar yen breaks down to 90, we'd probably be looking at gold closer up to 1500. But of course, now if, if they are able to hold 100 in the dollar yen and, and break that downtrend and shove it higher, then we're going to continue to, to have trouble uh, getting in traction to the upside. So that dollar yen is going to be the main thing to watch. It's going to key off of what the Fed is doing and the prospect of whether they're going to actually. <laughs> Raise rates in uh, December. 
But uh, in the meantime, uh, I'm like I said, I'm, I'm You're holding that hope. You're looking that, forward to that for three months, aren't you, Craig? Oh, my God. Yeah, you've probably seen that, Doc. That's like the worst part about what happened last week. I was just begging for the Fed to raise rates just because I'm so sick of this <laughs> one Fed, you know, one moment Lockhart says, oh, yeah, we're going to raise rates. And then they run out somebody else, you know, Evans or somebody. No, we're not going to. And then, they, you know, at the same time, two different Fed goons are giving two separate speeches arguing that we should raise rates or cut rates. And then these HFTs just just rape everybody based upon you know these headlines. I'll give you an example. Of, and this is the kind of thing that just makes me sick. Today, uh, and we again, this is something we see all the time now. Silver is cruising along at about 1930, 1935. You know, not really moving one way or the other. And then all of a sudden, I pull it up about eight o'clock this morning, 20 minutes, 30 minutes after the COMEX started trading, and all of a sudden, silver is 1970. And like, what happened here? And it's a straight spike up. And, and people are saying, oh, they always claim manipulation when it goes down, but they never claim manipulation when it goes up. And I instantly tweeted, here's manipulation of the upside. Because what happened? It was a short squeeze, very little liquidity, which is what happens when you got these HFT dominated markets, everything get pulled at once. And then you get a short squeeze back up and through the 50 day moving average and you get 30 cents in like a minute. And then what happens? We trade sideways for, I don't know, an hour. And then what happens? The HFTs take over and they run the stops back down, drop it back below the 50-day, run all the stops again. And by the time it's all said and done, we're right back to 1930. And the people that lose, is anybody with a stop order, any retail trader, you know, that's in there trying to trade gold and silver in the winter, of course, are these HFTs. And it's just, it's really hard to watch sometimes. And today was just your most recent example. I apologize. I feel like I've been talking for five minutes, so I'll stop now. <laughs> well, that's a great point. And it's important to see the bigger picture as well, too. I mean, if we look back the last couple of months, and, you know, particularly since Jackson Hole and Yellen's speech and Stanley Fisher doing his jawboning and all of the stuff that we've been forced to endure ever since, all the while, silver has actually been making slightly higher highs, yeah. or higher lows, excuse me. And it's it's hanging in there, and I spoke about this uh, last show, Doc, where it's all, it's like the, 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 the longer-term-oriented accumulators, the really strong money that's, that's scarfing up silver and has been doing so since 13 bucks and change, are really smart players. They, they're really... They're very sophisticated. They're playing the cartel and the need for the quote-unquote system to preserve itself by crushing metals as they have been, and they have been throwing the kitchen sink at metals all year. It, it, nonetheless, we have not seen any breakdown in the metals, and, and that, that's very important information that the market is telling us. And when you compare that uh, with what's going on with the whole options expiration cycle on comics, the open interest declining some 15, some odd percent or so, you know, I mean, it, it, it just makes uh, sense that all of this noise is, is only noise and that the true fundamentals at some point will assert themselves and move the markets higher. And last week when we were talking to Bill, figured, you know, after all of what we saw last week, maybe we'd have a pretty decent chance of staying above 20 and not getting mauled by the cartel this week. And that's what happened this week. I mean, they, they, the Clinton debate was a lot better than I certainly expected, given her health recently and, you know, passing out literally after making public appearances. It didn't look like she was going to be any health worthy of, of, you know, a major debate, like what she was able to actually pull off. You know, in the second half, she was okay with the help of the moderator. <laughs> that, that, that had a whole event-driven macro call that I was lining up last week on our show, talking about how, you know, Hillary might not do very well. And I'm not, you know, being political. I need to say that for our audience. I'm just doing basic analysis of how the markets would interpret what the debate would, in fact, uh, you know, inspire in terms of sentiment. And the fact that she did well, I think, also fit into, you know, calming markets, fears of, of Trump uh, sweeping and, and, and causing more turmoil. So that actually was fitting right into the man manipulation of financial markets because we had manipulation of the political scene and the debate and the media spin that came out of the debate and all that. And 
that's where we are this week. I think that what we've just seen in this last five days is nothing but noise. And the real fundamentals are being expressed. When we have the European seven-day uh, short-term funding market go through the kind of insane moves that it's doing right now as we record, that tells you a lot. And I think that you know later this year, forget later this year, you know, in the next 30 some odd days, even though they have been able to keep this from happening, I think we will go higher uh, because the market fundamentals are that strong and the problems in our markets are that bad. And people also need to realize that, well, it's been painful to watch over the last three or four months, really, after the first half that gold and silver had. Yeah, a three-month period where the metals correct mostly through time rather through price is extremely healthy and supportive long-term for um, the market. I mean, and to some extent, even normal and expected. Yes. Well, we'll see what the next week brings. It, you know, um, we're probably going to be stuck right around here, uh, absent these HFT stop runs and absent, you know, some complete meltdown of Deutsche Bank or something else. Because again, by next Friday, we'll have the latest edition of the most important jobs number of all time Yeah, yeah. Uh, to drive ratings to CNBC and Bloomberg. And, uh, and I would, if I were to hazard a guess, it'll probably come in uh, disappointing, maybe less than expected. And why would that be? Well, because then that'll give uh, the uh, Bloomberg and CNBC the cover as the sycophant media for the Fed to go out there and say, see, the Fed really is all-knowing. They're not political. No, no, no. It's, it's a good thing they didn't hike rates because look at this job report. There's only 120,000. That kind of thing is probably – and if that's the case, then we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be looking at higher prices by next Friday. But it, uh, again, as you mentioned, Doc, the, the worst part is uh, we've got to deal with this, this uh, garbage of, of every data point, every Fed sentence that gets muttered anywhere on the planet uh, and being a slave to that as you watch, as you watch prices move. I mean, it, it obviously, it, that's what we have to deal with, though, in this paper derivative pricing scheme. And until it ends, we're just kind of kind of stuck with it. It'll be fun to see what the Bureau of Labor Statistics Unicorn Factory produces in the next run. We don't call it the BLSBS for nothing. They'll have their work. Mm -hmm. I, I, I wouldn't be surprised. We actually see. I mean, they might put a good number just for the election to try to. No, that's sure true that, too. That's yeah. true too. Who, who the heck knows? <laughs> yeah, that's what I was going to point out. They'll have their work point cut out for them because they're going to have to do both of what you said, Craig plus the fact of managing that with the elections and wanting the number to still look pretty good. So 180,000 jobs. <laughs> yeah, I'd be right I don't even know the what the expectation is, actually. Yeah. I didn't even bother You're looking right. it up. But. Probably right down the middle. But yeah, So now right. we're slaves to that all through the next week, too. And so uh, uh, I couldn't blame you if you were pouring yourself a scotch because it's not a whole lot to look forward to. Anything interesting on the physical demand front? Talk before we wrap it up. Um, nothing new shocking in the market this week. I mean, demand's um, still pretty steady. The U.S. mint 420,000 Silver Eagles this week. Um, so it's actually up a little bit from what we've seen the last couple of weeks. So uh, month to date, September sales, uh, 1.675 million Silver Eagle coins, which is, uh, if you look at the whole year, it's pretty bad, but it's really the best number since, I think, June. Uh, yeah, best number since June. So uh, demand st remains strong. I mean, SD bullion the last like three months we've had we've set all time record sales months three months in a row. So I mean, from what we're seeing, it's still very strong. Well, I would think that that physical demand at the wholesale, you know, the the thousands and thousands of ounces level, the tonnage level. At the end of the day, that's the reason why the banks haven't been able to rig price back down. I mean, they're still carrying these massive short positions. Uh, obviously, uh, more than happy to add to those short positions whenever they need to. Open interest shot 45,000 contracts higher uh, late last week and early this week. Uh, and they added all that open interest in an attempt to meet spec demand for the paper derivative and to keep price in check. Uh, but they're happy to carry that. In the, but at the same time, they can't rig the price down either, and the, pri the primary reason they can't is they know that if they rig it down too far, then they're going to have these massive orders for physical metal that they're going to have to fill. Mm -hmm. 
And so there's this kind of tap dance going on that they're trying to manage. And, um, oh, I suppose uh, one day it's going to fail. I just wish that one day had been yesterday. All right. Well, we'll certainly uh, keep our eyes on the Deutsche Bank story over the weekend as it continues to develop. Hopefully uh, we won't have anything to report on uh, Sunday night into Monday. I think, like you guys said, I think... I think this bounce here will hold as long as uh, the Department of Justice doesn't come out and deny the, the rumors or anything mm-hmm. as far as uh, the settlement down to, to $4 billion. So um, certainly uh, setting up an interesting week in the markets next week as the fourth quarter gets underway here and the clouds roll into the Midwest. <laughs> <laughs> Are your Detroit Tigers going to make the playoffs, Doc? That's what we need to be talking about here. That's what we need to be talking about. The Tigers have a chance here to play uh, five must-win games in a row in five different cities. Five days in a row in five different cities here. Wow. Wow. That's impressive. Well, best of luck. And uh, uh, unfortunately, my team's out this year, but we'll see. We'll get them next year. But, yeah, happy weekend. Thank you very much for the opportunity to visit, guys. All right, and for uh, listeners who haven't checked out your site before, Craig, if you can let them know where they can find uh, all of your excellent analysis over at TF Metals. Oh, thank you. TFMetalsReport.com. Um, it's a, it, what's fun is it's a vibrant community. People that are really, really all looking out for each other. And we all recognize that, well, as, as much as we thought time has been short for the last couple of years, we got to kind of look down the barrel of Deutsche Bank this week. We know that the end of the great Keynesian experiment is coming, and so we're all out there trying to help each other and, um, and kind of navigate our way through it. So please, yeah, everybody check it out, tfmetalsreport.com. Yeah, and I suspect that we all uh, have a little part of us that wanted to just get it over with, kind of like uh, Craig was talking about the jobs report last week, and or uh, the Fed uh, FOMC last week and the hike in rates. We all have a little bit of us that want to, just want to get this whole thing over with, but uh, the other side of a financial collapse is not going to be pretty, even for those who have prepared with precious metals, I suspect. So. No, that's true. It's going to be that's absolutely true, hell, and <laughs> the fact that we have more time is a good thing. Yeah. No, that's right. That, that's definitely some perspective that you want to keep, no doubt about that. All right, so uh, we'll wrap up this week's show there. Thanks to Craig Hemke for joining us, for the Doc and Eric Dubin. Thanks for tuning in to the SD Weekly Metals and Markets.